Marina Arakovic, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks, guys. Did, did you steal your title Between Two Ferns and just replaced it with beers? We did. Originally, yeah. we thought the title would be uh, A Couple of Beers With, and then a friend suggested Between Two Beers. We thought it was great. Yeah, a big fan of Zach Galifianakis. Yeah, it's, it's it's good your first guest to pick up on that, so good okay. stuff. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, we're very excited to have you on. We've been excited for about three months. We reached out to you uh, in October, I think it was, saying we'd love to have you on as a guest. And you said uh, you were keen to come on January 6th at 9am. So here we are, January 6th, 9am. Is that an example of how busy and hectic your life is at the moment? It was. I, yeah, uh, with work and all the other stuff that I do, I just, I had no time in October. And um, I, I looked at the calendar. I'm like, yep, January 6th, I won't be doing anything. Let's see if they're free. Um, and it worked out. So yeah, apolo apologies for the wait. No, no apology needed. Uh, we liked it. We thought this is, this is different. Like we, we normally pee things up a few days before yeah. and sort of research the night before. So <laughs> this is a really, really nice change. Um, you're one of these characters. There's, there's such a, a lot to talk about. Um, and you've had such a big presence on the sports scene, but there's not actually a lot out there in the media, especially since you retired. So the first thing I wanted to check is is how many times have you picked up a tennis racket since retiring three years ago? Um, so I actually um, officially played my last match uh, end of 2017 in November. And I think I, I didn't actually physically pick up a racket for two years. Um, mm. And I really just wanted a break and to step away and to do something different. And 2018, I was still, um, you know, still trying to sort of get back on the tour, seeing how my back was doing. Um, and it wasn't until sort of halfway through 2018 that I realized that ah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be good, and I really can't, you know, I can't push through anymore. And that, and that was it. And then I officially retired at the end of 2018. But um, I kind of had a gap year, you could call it 2018. And yeah, I didn't, I mean, I still don't pick up a racket and play as in with, with someone properly. Uh, I've done a couple of things where I've um, had a laugh with some friends because they begged me to come on the court. Um, and the only other thing that I pick up a racket for is I sometimes work with youngsters, um, maybe once or twice a week, some of the top uh, 10 to 12 year olds in the country here in Auckland. So I'll, you know, after work, I'll, you know, but usually I just yell stuff. <laughs> I don't, I don't really, I don't really hit any balls. Um, and, and to be honest, like um, you'll ask me, do I miss it? And I like watching it now. I didn't watch tennis for a couple of years either. I like watching it now on the, on the TV, but um, you know, I'm just, I, I can't physically serve my shoulder stuff. My back is stuffed. It's just not a pleasant time. And when you've done something for that long at, at such a high level, it's, it's, you know, you know, it's not going to be the same, you know, things are going to hurt. So I just don't want to do that to myself. I, I know that you were studying while you were playing and finishing your career. Um, and I know you got your degree. There's been a few reports in the media that the last one we read suggested you were studying again to be a sp in sports medicine, perhaps working towards a doctor. But I also seen you've been working at Price Waterhouse Cooper. It seems like there's a lot, lot going on. So what, what have you been doing over the oh, last Oh, sure. I'll, I'll take you through it. So um, as I was playing, I finished two thirds of a BCom. Um, and then in 2018, I finished that off. I had eight papers left to go. So it took me about 100 years to finish, what was it, uh, I think 16 papers. And uh, I had eight papers to go. I finished those off at Auckland Uni. Um, so I majored in economics. And um, that degree, I started doing it because it was the only kind of legit degree that I could do while I was playing. Um, I couldn't do any sciences. I couldn't do anything that required time spent at the university. Um, and when I was younger, I always had a big interest in science and in the body, especially when I was playing about, um, especially sports medicine. I've been in and out of physios and doctors my whole life and just trying to make sure 
that I'm healthy and doing things right and rehabbing and prehabbing from many injuries. Um, and even when I was a youngster, if tennis didn't work out, I always thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'd really want to try and go for medicine. So at the end of 2018, I was like, man, as you do, what should I do in my life? And um, I basically said, no, nah, I'll give it a go. I'll try and get into med. And I, I went into health sciences at the University of Auckland in 2019 and really loved it. Uh, did really well. I got like really good grades. I made it to the last round. I made it to the interview round, but I didn't make it. And um, so in order for me to keep pursuing that, I had to potentially, you know, go for another couple of years with uncertainty of whether I'll get in again, or maybe even I'd have to go to another country. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not 21 anymore, right? I'm not, I'm not. So I have to, I had to think of a little bit more smart about, you know, what I wanted to do. And I just felt like, hey, I've got, I've got a business degree and I'm actually really good at, art and so i i draw a lot i do graphic design for fun um man is there something that i could do that was kind of like that it wasn't businessy it was maybe a bit more creative um and so i kind of started looking around talking to people um and one friend of mine recommended me to pwc and their experience consulting team which is basically it's actually really a bit difficult to explain, but they they use human centered design. And what is human centered design? It may and mainly it's like, hey, um, let's whatever we do, whatever we make, let's actually talk to the people that'll use it and design it and create it for how they want to use it or how they would like to use it. And that's a really simplified explanation. But in that team, you've got um, graphic designers, you've got behavioral scientists, you, you've got quite you know, quirkier kind of careers. And I thought, wow, this is cool. And so I interviewed for this role um, and I start and I got it and I started in um, May this uh, last year. And what are we now? 2020, last year, 2021. Um, and that, yeah, that's my last three or four years in a bit of a nutshell. That's awesome. Yeah, we look, to, look forward to digging into the personality traits that look like they're going to make you successful off court as they were on uh the way we start things at between two beers is we tell the audience how we know the guests so shay how do you know marina first time first time we've met first time we've spoken um it is early january here in new zealand um and normally uh around this time it's probably quarterfinals of what was the asb classic which has been uh, on ice for the last couple of years and for i think 12 years um, you were gracing the courts at Stanley Street, um, watched your career, obviously, from afar. We were in the Olympic team together in 2012, believe it or not. I was the, um, I was not an athlete. I can see the look of surprise on your face. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't an athlete. I was part of the support staff for the men's football team. So I don't think we actually crossed paths because we would, we were out, um, in different venues, but so that's kind of my connection. And in, in in researching the pod, I, I really only knew the tip of the iceberg, which was the tennis side. So I'm really looking forward to digging into to the background story and what you're doing now. Um, Stevie, you're probably going to give some sort of a generic answer about working in the sports media and following Marina's career from afar. <laughs> How are you going to do that to me, Shay? No, uh, no, I'm not going to say that. Uh, I, I have worked very closely with uh, New Zealand tennis aficionado Matt Brown over the last 10 years. And my desk is right next to his. So every time I go up to the uh, Auckland office, I often hear some pretty passionate uh, Marina Arakovic chat. Um, but I've watched you on screen and have enjoyed your journey. Yeah, but I don't think I really had an appreciation for what you've done until the last week when I've been studying you. So yeah, looking forward to getting into it. We're going to start, we like to give the audience a bit of a wider scope on someone who knows you well and what they say about you. So this is from former player and former tennis New Zealand board member, Will Ward, who says, uh, Marina is a smart, funny, kind, caring and talented individual. Despite the success she had, she never changed and always had time for people. While she achieved a top 40 singles ranking in a truly global sport, New Zealand media and people probably don't appreciate how good she was at what she did. 
Marina will succeed at whatever she puts her mind to. She has a drive, focus, and determination that is rare in this country. That was a, a, a great summary from Will Ward. Uh, so when deciding where to start, there, there are so many places we could go. Um, but the, the piece that caught our attention and we want to chat about at the top is your musical journey. So you taught yourself to play guitar and drums on tour, and you've released two music EPs under the pseudonym The Mad Era, while in various locations around the world. And we spent a bit of time on your Instagram page, and it's red hot. Like your, your guitar and your drums and the videos you make where you're sort of superimposing yourself and you're playing with yourself, um, that don't. <laughs> No, 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 that sounds no. worse than what it's supposed uh, to sound. Like, was was they're great videos. The content is red hot. Um, not making it any better. Is that something that you are looking to continue? Because you're, you're really good. Yeah, I mean, I actually uh, I got off of social media in 2018. I I stopped it. I um, uh, well, let's start with the music side. So, um. Yeah, I was in a, in California. I was I was playing. I was maybe 20, 21, and I was playing a tournament. I sprained my ankle quite badly, and I was there. I was supposed to play there for five or six weeks, and it was early on that that happened, and I had to rest for two or three weeks. I had to skip some tournaments, and I was feeling pretty, you know, crap. Um, and next door to the, my hotel was a guitar shop, and. Uh, I thought, okay, this could be fun. I'll go in there and I'll, you know, maybe pick up a little mini guitar and I'll kill some time. And so that's exactly what I did. And started traveling with this really tiny Yamaha acoustic and I started learning. And that was before the days of, um, gosh, I sound old, but before like you had the smartphones with the, you know, you could look whatever you wanted to look at. So what I would do was I would, um, go to the tournament and they'd always have a printer and the internet and so I'd print out like chords and what to you know how to learn stuff and because you have a lot of downtime <clears throat> when you're playing tennis so you know it could be raining it could be traveling you could be in your hotel room at night so I just started learning and I really loved it it was um, in a way it turned out to be my escape from whatever people do they meditate they you know go for a walk for me it was that to switch off and um basically i you know i got better at it i started to you know i bought a little uh, it's, it's called a traveler guitar it was electric you can plug it into your computer you can put your headphones on and i started to you know get better at it um uh, and then i started to do covers and and just play and um and then i started uh to mainly do my own stuff and I mainly it was instrumental and um and then I was like man it'd be cool if someone could sing on this and I was like but I can't really sing um but whatever I'll just try so I you know I, I don't know if you've <laughs> you probably don't listen to it but um, I have no I loved it I thought it was really good um, I don't often do it stop it but thank you um so yeah and then i just started you know and i did those two eps and i just i really love the process it's kind of like art for, in a way you kind of you're making tracks you're making things sound like the way you want to sound and it's quite uh, you know and it, it's it was relaxing for me um and then i've you know i i always struggled a little bit with social media with you know like just posting photos of yourself at the tennis courts every time <laughs> and i thought man maybe i'll just do something different that i enjoy so um i just started posting various videos of playing stuff and covers and edit and edit, editing it and um and that's what i did and then i i quit i mean i quit social i don't really go on it much anymore because honestly i think it didn't really help my mental health and constantly looking at, you know, what others are doing and it, it killed a lot of time for me. And I thought, nah, I've, I've got to, I got to stop. And so, and honestly, I now I just don't have time. Uh, I haven't, I haven't played the guitar and like, I just picked it up now with the summer break, but it's just been a bit full on. Um, and you might ask, why didn't I pursue a music thing? <laughs> and uh, I still like to do it for fun, but um I, I think I think like career wise it's it's pretty difficult to make a, a living from that you know but I still 
I enjoy it and I have lots of fun with it. Um, and I can't remember what your question was, but here you go. <laughs> um, two, two things jump out for me. First is, wh which was more daunting, preparing for a match against like a, a, a top 10 player or putting your music out into the world for people to digest? Oh, um, oh that's why I did a that's why I did a pseudonym, a pseudonym show. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, all right. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I, you know what, I, I felt like I'd play it to like my sister or my friends. I was like, what do you, you know, what do you think? Oh, it sounds great, you know? And I was like, okay. And I thought, man, I don't really, you know, I'm making this stuff, but I don't know if anyone will like it. So I thought, why don't I just put it out there? I'll do a pseudonym um great put it out there and i and i got and i said to myself if one person likes it um that'll make my day and that's it's what happened like i got a, it's a little bit like starting yeah. a podcast exactly the same thing <laughs> um the, the other the other just to jump in the other thing we received some feedback recently on our own intro song i'm going to try and play a little bit for you now um and we're wondering maybe I don't know. Could you pick up the guitar and the drums and maybe look at doing something for us for 2022? <laughs> let's see. You can, let's see if let's see, let's see if the wonders of technology will allow this to kind of play. But awesome! I love love to hear it. Now the it's, feedback it's that we very got. Cool. Thank you. The feedback that we got was it was a little bit soft porn intro, and that that floored us. We didn't really expect it, so we're very comfortable with it. But if you do have time and you're able to deliver something in the next three to six months, we're open to uh, to receiving something from you. Uh, sound that sounded to me like a mix of Shaft, Motown, and reggae. Um, you know there the you movie Sh Shaft or Shaft? Yeah, 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 like that. But that no, sounded good. I, I. Porno did not come to mind, so all good. Thank you. There was a very specific <laughs> mind that gave us that feedback, so I'm glad Look, that it, it hasn't hurt. Yeah, absolutely. I can, um, if we have a chat after and you tell me what kind of theme you'd want, I, I'm sure I'll have some time over the summer, so I'll, I'll make a jingle or something. Nailed it. <laughs> Can't believe he's gone for it. Yeah, um, it just, just the last uh, question on your Instagram. There's some really good chat and some really good uh, captions and, and bants on it. I know Shay's... Uh, really enjoyed it <laughs> yeah I, did. I feel like um when you're perhaps giving interviews and doing media with your tennis hat on it perhaps doesn't allow people to see your real personality i'd like to think instagram is your real personality like some of the stuff what was the one the messy one oh you, you like you and messi getting matching haircuts that was genius <laughs> the other one that that tickled me and i was giggling for a little while was uh a photo of you going to a wedding and you were like First wedding ever, uh, wedding crashes mode, hashtag motorboat. And I died. I was <laughs> instinctive. It was like, brilliant. Some, somebody's kind of got the same referential, like, cultural <laughs> gags as uh, as us, which was awesome. Which, to be to totally honest with you, tennis persona versus private persona, I did not expect. So, hence being so excited to, to get you on and to kind of pick away at, uh, at who Marina Rakovic is. Oh, th thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I think... Um... Now that I've finished tennis, because um, I've, I've had a couple of comments, like someone said, oh, in the media, you've, you've kind of been a bit serious or a bit monotone or quite, uh, you can even say boring or whatever you want to call it. I, I feel like every time I went into a tennis interview, it was always the same questions. And it was either after a loss or a win, and you talk about the game and... Um, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like I could press a little play button in my head and it, someone would just start talking and that would be me. Um, and also, I, you know, I, I felt like it was my job. And I don't know if you, if you interview someone at PwC about their job, would it, would it be super interesting? I, I don't know. I, I think tennis is different, obviously, but um, maybe it was because I was going through the monotony of my days and it was always the same thing over and over again. Um, and my sister who knows me really well, she's like, why don't you just be yourself in the interview? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I just, I, I couldn't, 
I could I I guess I was too you know maybe too focused on just saying the right thing or you know talking about the tennis or the spe you know specific stuff as opposed to having a laugh in the in the media interview. Yeah, because that's not important, right? It's important to get results on the court. The media stuff is kind of like a, a side thought and your repetitive questions, same questions, there's no real motivation for you to really entertain in that. Perhaps until the later part of your career, did you find that there was a difference with the way you interacted with the media between the first half and the second half of your career? Yeah, for sure. I think in the first half, even when I was starting out, I was super nervous. I, you know, I wanted to say the good things I wanted to, you know, obviously it's, it's actually really nerve wracking when you're a kid and you're being asked questions. Um, and then it's, it gets easier and you know what the questions are coming, you know what to say, you become trained. And I think then you get to a later stage when you kind of just don't care anymore. <laughs> and, I mean, some of my mates and I and on the tour later on would, you know, I don't know if you ever do this, but we would do like a, it would be a code word of the day that you have to throw into the interview. So sometimes <laughs> it would be like banana or carrot or I don't know, something stupid like the matrix. And, I, you know, you just invent a story to say in, in the media and um, just to make it more fun. No, no offense to you guys. This is quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh good that's very good um before before we before we jump off and start talking about boring tennis um two more kind of uh interesting observations just from from researching one whoever's doing your wikipedia page has a very detailed knowledge <laughs> of your career <laughs> that is freaky honestly if that person could reveal themselves i'd really appreciate it. i've never seen anything like it i read I, I mean i've read through it I, I don't think i've read through the whole thing but I don't remember some of that stuff. I, I have no idea what they're what's what they're saying. Maybe I maybe it's true. Great, but yeah, it's sure. so detailed. I've never seen anything like it. But it's, it's also sorry, Steve. It's, it's also like it starts off quite. You go, oh yeah, it's standard Wikipedia, and then it really <laughs> goes into some detail through the yes. back end of your career. It's like wow. Yeah, I I if that yeah if that person's out there and they want to let me know who they are, like. It's it's incredible. Like how do, how how do they know this stuff? I honestly I don't remember some of the stuff that's written there. They they talk about some stuff that's like so long ago and in such detail. I I yeah, it's it's mind boggling. I'm glad I'm glad you've answered like that. There was a um an old all whites coach, Anthony Hudson, mm. who used to update his own Wikipedia page. Well, they they think they did because they traced the some sort of football fans traced the IP address of who was making the changes to like New Zealand football headquarters at a time only he was there <laughs> and he kept they kept battling him with um you know they would say his results weren't what he claimed and then he would change it but oh, me gosh. and Shay were having a conversation about your Wikipedia page we're like do you think she maybe she's done it she does it she surely not no way but yeah it I, is so I recommend if you're listening to this, go check out Marina yeah. Rakovic's Wikipedia page because you're you're sure you're sure to learn a thing or two. The, the other I, the other one. Oh, go on, go on, Marina. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say I I can't remember. Like, there's I don't remember what happened a year ago. That no way that I can go into that much detail. The um the other really interesting one as well is your LinkedIn page, which is incredibly detailed. And we're just while we're talking about the media. It uncovered something that both Stephen and I didn't kind of realize or didn't remember or didn't pay attention to was your stint on The Crowd Goes Wild. Um, yeah. So did you take any experiences from being on the other side of the camera into that role? Absolutely. I, uh, I yeah, I don't know if you know the guy Rick Salizzo. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so basically, yeah, he's an awesome guy. And I was... That, that was, I think, early 2018 when I was, my back was still quite bad. And um, I, I, Rick actually lived on the same street that I did. And sometimes I'd see him walking and I, um, and I asked him, hey, can I come like hang out and see what you guys do or do you need a hand? And so, yeah, I did that for six months while I was still kind of rehabbing and recovering. And it was, it was such an awesome experience. And um, I really, I, th I just remembered the crowd as well because that was my favorite interview to do when I was at home because it was a lot of fun and it was always different and you could sort of say silly things. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it was definitely awesome to actually 
think about the stuff to do with the sports person. So I think there was one um, rugby player that uh, I forgot what it was exactly, but we, we got him to go into a, like a vending machine with that claw thing to pick up something. We set it up and it's just, it was so creative. It was awesome. It was just like, Hey, it'll be cool to get, you know, sports people to do fun stuff instead of just the same questions. And, um, yeah, I really loved it. So that if Rick's listening, thanks Rick for that experience. <laughs> I, I tried to find some, some footage of some of the stories that you did online and I, I couldn't. But what I did find uh, from the crowd goes wild, and I don't know if you're aware of this, is a clip where Andrew Mulligan, when Andrew Mulligan was hosting, was forced to eat his own words because I think he said that you wouldn't, you wouldn't make the uh, second round or the third round of the US Open in 2014. And he literally, I'll, I'll tag it into the show notes, he literally had the, I don't know, I assume it was, the script from the night before, tore it into little pieces and then physically ate it and had to drink water to force it down. Have you seen that? Yes, unfortunately, I, I did. L- later after uh, after all of that, I um, I saw it. Oh, it's it's hilarious. Th- those guys are really they're really good at what they do, and um, I hope he did not have stomach pain after that. Yeah, passing that would have been a trouble. Um, I want to pick up the story from when your parents moved to New Zealand with you from Yugoslavia in 1994. Um, I've heard you reference. I've listened to a few interviews you've done, and you've sort of referenced that. When you arrived, you had nothing or, or very little. Um, I think you were six years old uh, and you didn't speak English, from what I understand. Um, are you able to give us some background in, in as much or as little detail as you want to go into about why you came to New Zealand and, and how those early years were for you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, at the time, it was um, the war in former Yugoslavia. Um, and it was a war around um, basically you have three ethnic groups and and you, you former Yugoslavia you've got uh, and it's it's all kind of based on religion so it's similar to like Palestine and Israel or Ireland or all that crap that goes on so um, you have three different ethnicities and you obviously had each of these ethnicities living everywhere but you know now these countries wanted to have their own sort of um countries and basically push out all the other ethnicities that weren't part of their ethnicity and so that's where my family got caught up because i had a mum and dad with mixed mixed marriage and um it was just a really hard time obviously i was born in split croatia um but um there wasn't war there but it was just, you know, you, everyone knew which ethnicity you were. So you were basically singled out and given a really hard time. And when I say really hard time, I mean, basically we were, uh, we were kicked out of our home. Our home was taken from us and we had to move in with my granddad. And, uh, we, my mom and dad realized that, you know, we, us as kids I have an older sister we couldn't really grow up there and have a a good life and so they started searching for places to go uh, you know to leave and so my my dad actually got a job initially in South Africa um, in Cape Town but it fell through last minute and we had some friends who moved to New Zealand and at that time New Zealand was looking for immigrants and skilled immigrants and so my mum and dad fit the criteria, and um, and when I say we came with nothing, we really did. Like everything was pretty much gone, and we came with the stuff we could take with us, and we basically stayed with our friends for a little while before we kind of my dad got a job and they could find work, and um, yeah, just started a whole new life in a, in a new place and. Um, I, I just remember always my mom saying, you know, I ask her, how was it, you know, what was it like? You're like 35 years old. You don't know anyone. You've got two little kids. Um, you know, was it terrifying? And she goes, not as terrifying as constantly looking behind your back. And, you know, it was like a, a freedom. Um, so yeah, and I was six years old. My sister was nine and I picked up English pretty quick as you do as a youngster. And, yeah, no, no regrets. Well, you know, it was just an um, amazing because 
yeah, people don't realize how lucky we are in New Zealand. You know, it doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, you can do anything. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful and thankful that we we made it here and um, and what a privilege to play for New Zealand at the end of the day because what a country that took us in and really, you know, helped us <laughs> be very happy. There's probably a, a, a younger generation listening to this that are just completely oblivious to to that situation that happened in the former Yugoslavia, you know, way back then. It's And you're right, your, your comments are, are, are spot on in terms of how lucky we actually are to, to be here. But do you, have you... Have you made sense of that as you've got older? Like when you were six years old, did it did it make sense, or was it just we're getting on a plane and we're moving to another country and we're not living at home anymore? Uh, no, I mean, as a youngster, I I didn't make really. I mean, I knew that things were bad. Uh, I still have some, you know, bad memories uh, from from when I was little, uh, but. I don't know. I think you just, as a kid, you just so, you know, you adapt and you're so malleable and you can just get on with it. Um, I think I started to make sense of it <clears throat> more later on. And obviously we go back now and it's, you know, it's fine. And I still have family from all over former Yugoslavia. Um, and I love going back and I love seeing my uncle and my cousins and, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Croatia, but it's, it's really beautiful and it's great to take a holiday. But, um, I, you know, I could never, I could, people ask me, you know, could you ever live there? I've no, because it's, it's a completely different planet to me. It's, um, yeah, I, there's still a lot of that tension there around who you are and where you're from and I think you know that's just that's something I don't want to be a part of it's it's an incredibly tough childhood being forced out of your home having to move country to one that you don't speak the language having nothing we're going to get into the tennis stuff a bit later but do you think the resilience and the hardship of those early years set laid the platform for your success when you're overseas for 10 11 months of a year and it's hotels and airports and by yourself because of those sort of maybe first 10 years of your life i think so i think it contributed a, a huge part um definitely with the word resilience um i think any immigrants to a new country they always tend to as i don't know but work harder you know because they have to make and it they pass on to their children and i've seen that not just with you know former yugoslav people with all kind of ethnicities and you just kind of yeah you have to kind of work harder than the next guy because you're new and you you know you're you don't have any foundations to rely on so i think that definitely was a part of it and probably what contributed to a really good work ethic a real a really big drive to succeed um so, yeah, the, the answer is yes. I, I want you to help me connect the dots here. So you arrived to New Zealand age six, I think it was. Don't speak English. At age 15, you're the number one female tennis player in New Zealand. So I'm assuming you haven't played tennis when you get here. Like, how Can you talk us through exactly how much tennis you were playing on a daily basis <laughs> through those early years? <laughs> You, you know, people think it was like uh, I was like a child labor. I was playing six hours a day when I was eight years old. Actually, it wasn't at all. So I first picked up a racket when I was about five or six. Uh, when I was first in Croatia, um, my sister, so my dad, he played recreationally at the local club. And so when it was his time to take care of me and my sister, he'd take us to the tennis courts and he signed up my sister into the squad there. She was nine or eight or whatever, but I was too young. So I would kind of wait for them to do their tennis and I'd, put, I'd take a racket and a ball and hit against a wall waiting for them. And that's how I started and kind of got good at that. And then it wasn't until I kind of I went, came to New Zealand, um, I still played a little bit with my dad and my sister, <clears throat> you know, for fun as a family. And it wasn't until I was about eight years old that I joined the squads back then in Auckland Tennis, which was when 
Chris and Mark Lewis. I don't know if you remember Chris Lewis, but they kind of came back from their life overseas and started some squads in New Zealand. So I joined that at eight years old. And I mean, that was maybe like once a week uh, wow. for, you know, one like, and then maybe I'd play with my dad on the weekend or something. So when I was about uh, 12, uh, 11 or 12, I was living out in West Auckland and it was now it was maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week. So it was, it was hard because I had to drive from West Auckland after school to, um, to Merton Road to Scarborough Tennis Centre. That's where it was. So it was a bit of a drive for my mum and dad. And so we sometimes share with another kid who was also in the squad who lived out in West Auckland. So we drive and, and then my dad could see that I was getting quite good. And so, cause some of the coaches, and so we actually moved towards Scarborough tennis center. Cause you know, we, we moved when I was about 13, I think. And when I was about, yeah, 14 or 15, then it became a little bit more full on. So, I was probably playing maybe three or four times a week and I was playing all the tournaments, uh, you know, juniors. So I, I think what, and, and I don't mean to sound like an absolute arrogant person here, but I think what people don't realize is that being really good as a junior in New Zealand doesn't really mean anything. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a successful tennis player worldwide. In fact, it's chances are you're probably not. So uh, if you win the under 14s nationals, it really doesn't mean anything. You know, you actually have to get exposure and see what the kids in Europe are doing, what the kids in the States are doing. You need to compete with those kids and see what that level is. So I remember very early on my, my coach at the time was Chris Lewis until I was about 17 years old. Um, he said, you know, whatever you do in New Zealand, it doesn't mean anything like you winning national titles here is just, it's nothing. You actually perform over overseas. And so uh, when I was 14, I won the under 14s, under 16s and under 18s nationals in one year, um, which was <laughs> never done before. Uh, and then I think I kind of stopped playing juniors and I was playing a lot more. So when I was, 16 i started playing about 15 16 i started playing the junior itf circuit so the world circuit um and i was actually pretty fortunate because i went to glendowie college and the school actually saw that i was quite good and i was doing really well and it's it's actually unusual they actually let me travel and play these junior events and organized for me to be helped out by a, a teacher um individually which was just incredible um so again hats off to glendowie college and so in six and seven form when i was about 16 17 that's when i was really playing all the time and i was training i was traveling and um i i think i got to five number five junior in the world when i was 17 um and I was just really also glad that I finished high school because in my last seven form year, I just, it, you barely had time for anything. So um, I think I was, my Leavers jersey said absent. <laughs> <laughs> did you get to go to things like a school ball and stuff or was that all? Just... I did because that was in November, I think. So that's when there were no real tournaments. So I actually did. I got to go to my six form and seven form ball. Um, but yeah, I mean, for sure, I definitely missed out a whole chunk of, um, you know, normal high school teenage life. Um, and, you know, it, I think, and then it continued on and you kind of just, you kind of miss all, like, I just remember coming back and my, my friends would be like in uni and they'd be partying and drinking and I'd be so disconnected from it all. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, I, I remember, I don't know if you remember Simon Bray, he, he uh, is a good coach. He was um, part of Tennis New Zealand for a little while, a few years ago. And he asked me, what do I, what's the thing that I take out the most after tennis? And I said to him that I just came out normal on the other side. Yeah. You know, it's actually, 
it's a really interesting journey and a lot of players you know they don't and they don't go to school and they don't have, even have a social ability to connect with others and they miss that whole chunk of their life so um yeah that's i'm so fortunate that i did have a pretty good childhood when when you did go to high school when you were attending were you treated differently were you treated like a little bit of a mini celebrity when you're 15 and you're the best tennis player in the country fifth best in the world like you know at lunchtime <laughs> where the kids getting the tennis rackets out saying come on marina come on serve us a few like are the teachers giving you differential treatment uh yeah it was i mean the the difference was that i I'd, I'd sometimes make it into the newspaper right or on the tv after an event or something i did and then one time the camera would come into the school and you know then oh that's that's from marina you know and it it was one one time oh this is, cracks me up still but uh so at glenda we we had a red uniform for many years and you know i just came back to school one day after a trip away and i was in my red uniform and the whole school changed to a completely new uniform it was blue and so i was like <laughs> this red thing and, and the mass of blue uh, you know it's, it's stuff that i just you know miss uh what what else oh also you know obviously you, this this all cost money to do this and i wasn't being supported by any federation or any sponsor or anything so it was all my parents so one year um my school did a mufti day for me they did they raised money to help me go on a trip so it was like two dollars on a friday and um yeah so it was um yeah, definitely six and seven. Four. It's, it's probably because I was, yeah, I was probably in the news or the TV would come or, or whatever it was. So it was a bit, it was a bit weird sometimes. Yeah. Just to j jump back a little bit, um, I was quite surprised by that answer about how little tennis you played between the ages of sort of eight or 13, 14, whatever it was. Um, my, I was talking to Shay before the episode, and I was like, "Tennis players go hard when they're young, eh? To be successful, you, they must That's be out the there yeah. three, four hours a day. Like it's all technique. You've just got to go and go and go." Is that how the other best young players in the world do it? Were you different, or or do you think a lot of them sort of took the path you took? I think a lot of them did. I think um, I I think there's a certain point where uh you know there's a certain point where you kind of have to actually put in the work if you want to actually achieve this or become a player and it is quite young so uh when i was probably 11 or 12 that was kind of probably the the between time where yep uh we should probably in a couple of years be working a lot harder and don't get me wrong throughout my high school i train um I train before school and after school. So sometimes like five in the morning, you know, and then after and fitness and whatever. But I was quite a scrawny little skinny kid. And I actually didn't do a lot of fitness at all because I just my body wouldn't take it. Um, so I, I think it really depends on the type of kid you've got. Right. Um, and I, I think there's definitely players out there who did not train six hours a day as a 10 year old, you know, and who were homeschooled. There's also this various elements. It's such a, such a needle in a haystack to make it as a tennis player. It's kind of like luck and hard work and mental ability and physical ability and talent and all of these things that have to combine. Um, but yeah for me it was probably around 13 or 14 when i and it still wasn't six hours a day or anything like that it was probably every day right so um it really depends on on the on the kid but at a certain level or a certain point you do have to make a decision right are we going to push for this or not so I, I, we come from a football background. I've been lucky enough to travel with New Zealand youth teams and stuff like that. And one of the interesting things is to chart the progress of players that played at Youth World Cups and see where they end up. I guess it's the same on the tennis circuit, but for those that are un un uninitiated, ugh, you got it? Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, you know, I struggle sometimes. Um, who were your contemporaries on that, that junior circuit at that time? 
Um, yeah, so you and had players. Feel free yeah. to name drop the big ones. <laughs> this is this is this is uh, contextualize it for everybody. So my year were Gail Monfils, uh, Victoria Zarenka, um, Simona Halep was a little bit older. Um, Novak Djokovic was two years above me, so I caught the tail end of him on the junior circuit. Uh, you had, um, oh, let me think now from the woman's side. Uh, I mean, some names you wouldn't know, but Kristen Flipkins, Michaela Krychik, I think they were kind of number one and two junior. Um, I'd have to, I have to look, go back and look at the list. Is there a in there? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Caroline was my year. Yeah, yeah we played um, we played against each other in juniors. Oh, Rudvanska was another one. Played together in juniors. Um, from the men's side. <sighs> yeah, I honestly, I'd have to go back and look at the list. Yeah. I'm sure I could find it, but yeah, there was it was quite it was it was tough. And I'm I'm curious, what's the process in going from being a junior to being a pro? Like, is there a, a a license thing? Do you just just wake up one morning and decide I'm going to be a pro now? Like, how how does that actually work? So, um, basically, it's a really tough transition, and I think there's a stat out that I read. It's if you are not a top 100 junior. Um, you have less than 2% chance of making it as a professional. Um, mm -hmm. So what happens is, is that you kind of reach that junior high level and then you start playing lower level professional events. So uh, what we call them is ITF, 15,000s, 25,000s. So they're just smaller events and you, you might start in your home country if there are any or you might start traveling if you are really good so if you're like a top 10 junior um or if you've won you know junior grand slams you're probably starting to get picked up by an agency like an img or a sponsor or whatever that have access to wild cards to main events professional events so someone like a i think a gail monfils probably who, who won i think three out of the four junior slams when I was in one of my years, he would have probably gotten wild cards into some of the big events, right? Um, there's also a cap on as a, I think it's if you're 18 and under, there's a cap on how many tournaments you can play professionally because of various reasons, but mainly burnout and to protect the youngster from overplaying. Um, so that those are kind of the the steps to take. But in essence, it's really like, wow, I've made it through a really amazing tour and now I gotta start again. It's kind of like going from intermediate school to high school or high school to university. You kind of you start to become a, just a a, a a first year again. So there may be some listeners who don't appreciate your whole wider journey so i'm going to read out a few uh bullet points which might help paint a, a clear picture so a decade in the world's top 100 competed in 36 grand slams reached a career high 39 in the world won nine wta titles and 18 itf titles competed at two olympic games one commonwealth games played more than 600 main draw singles matches including 44 grand slams and traveled to over 50 countries um, there's obviously a lot there. I feel like perhaps <laughs> a lot there. People might understand that you were very good and at the top of New Zealand for a decade, but I don't think we understand. And this is the part that I kind of want to get into: what it actually means, how hard it is to be a professional tennis player coming from New Zealand. Like how how many months of a year you're away from home, uh, hotels and airports, and being by yourself. Um, yeah, you're able to to give as much detail as you can about life on the road and how tough it actually is. And we might pick apart a couple of things and throw some throw some stuff in there because there's questions just going around <laughs> and around in my head about what it looks like. Yeah, I um, I mean, the, first off, uh, 
there's a few things that you, you need to understand. So coming from New Zealand is the, is the important thing. Why is it tougher? It's because, uh, A, you're far away from everything. So you tennis in New Zealand is kind of non-existent. There isn't a level of competition there where you can actually get better. And uh, everything is far, so you have to fly to tournaments. This will cost money and, and equipment. Tennis is not a sport that's funded in New Zealand. That's, it hasn't been for many, many, many years. And again, that's the main thing without money, without actually helping someone to get there, um, you can't really do it unless you've got some kind of other funding or your whole family basically sacrifices their life to help you, which in my case was what happened. Um, and the other thing is um, tennis is not on TV in New Zealand, so kids don't aspire to watch it uh, or to play it. Uh, tennis is also, it's not a game that kids really want to play and I don't blame them because it's an individual sport. You're out there by yourself. It's tough for a 10 year old. And then the parents are there and it's stressful and it's not like going playing cricket or football or rugby or whatever you want with your mates and having fun and making friends. It's, it's not like that. So there are various elements that already um, set you up for a challenge. And uh all those things combined, uh, and I can only speak from my case, is that uh, it's it's a for me it was a huge. Uh, I felt a lot of pressure, not because my parents were pushy or anything like that, but I felt a lot of pressure because my dad basically he he was a sh he he is a ship's captain, so he works on six weeks on six weeks off shifts on 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 the ship. And so whenever he was off, he'd travel with me as a youngster to these tournaments because I couldn't go by myself. So basically my mom and my sister didn't see my dad and it was a huge financial burden for my parents for many, many years until I was about 19 where a foundation was set up called the Seed Foundation um, to basically help me to transition from juniors to seniors um, and if it wasn't for them, honestly, I don't think I could, I would have made it. Um, so it was a constant battle to a find money to play. And then imagine as a kid, you're playing and you lose. Oh, well, oh shit. You know, now, and you know, I got a, am I, is this worth it? I'm putting my mum and dad through all this crap. And so it's, it's a real, uh, mental pressure. And then also, you are kind of by yourself. Sometimes you'll be with a coach. A lot of times I was traveling by myself early on when my dad couldn't make it. And you just got to figure things out by yourself. And um, the other thing is you are literally a tennis player and a whole business owner slash management runner and you organize your own flights and your own accommodation and everything is you. Um, there's no like, you know, in a, in a team sport, like, I don't know, but you know, football team going overseas, they don't have to think about yeah, flights. That's my, that's my job. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's your job. Right. So, and until you make it to a very elite level in tennis where you can afford that stuff, fantastic. But you know, if you are, the stat is if you are 70 in the world, 70, 70, 75 in, in women's tennis, you are breaking even. So imagine that you're top 70 in something in the world and you're breaking even. So you're, you're basically what you're earning is covering your costs because the costs are astronomical, right? So you're paying for your own flights, your own accommodation. If you want someone with you, you're also paying them a, a coach, a decent salary. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a blow <laughs> of stuff yeah. there for you. But, um, that's some of the things that make it why is it so hard you've, you've burst my bubble on the entourage question that i had because i was it, again in in your mind you're thinking yeah like uh the accommodation is covered when you get to a tournament but no idea that that, that wasn't the case that you're traveling with you know like a your, your coach 
a trainer, something like that. But clearly, uh, clearly the the delusions of, of what the tennis circuit is really like are exactly that for, for the uninitiated. I got that word right. Yeah, I, I think the, the irony is, is that the better you do, the more stuff is paid for, which I find hilarious. So if you're doing really well, you usually get, you know, if you're at a Grand Slam, you'll get a per diem or you'll get your room covered, but you have to pay for your coaches. And the more you do, the more free stuff you get, which is the irony, right? So, um, but yeah, in essence, like, like I said, with those stats, um, if you're kind of around 70 and if you're getting top 50, it's, your life is a lot easier. Um, but yeah, you you are paying for the majority of your stuff with a few freebies from the tournament sometimes. And make no mistake about it, you could organize a Mufti Day every Friday from third form to seventh form at Glendowie, and it still wouldn't cover the cost of a year, right? No, no. So the cost of a year, if you have a full-time coach, um, so 100000 so you're looking at uh, around 200000 250000 US dollars. And Stephen loves a money question, so I can just <laughs> see the dollar sign spinning around in his eyes. Jesus. Yeah. Um, so give us a picture of how I'm trying to think of the what right way to ask it, but you're away from home for so long, for many, many months at a time. Uh, you're by yourself a lot of times leading up to big games. Like that it, it's such a, a cauldron of stress and mental challenges. Like how did you did you create little routines to help get you through once you arrived? And and how how did you spend the time when you're just by yourself all day? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think uh, like like all sport, it's a never ending strive to sort yourself out up here, right? To to remain in the moment and to be able to perform um, and not let thoughts and other things and pressure and all that other baggage interfere with your performance. So. Um, the, the the thing is after a year you know after repeating events you kind of get to know what works for you and you get to know what you'd like and how you'd like to train and what you do when you arrive and uh, the reason why I was away from New Zealand a lot was because it didn't make sense to come back to New Zealand you know for a 24-hour flight for 10 days and then fly off again so uh in my career I've had about four coaches and the first one was Dutch, second one was American, third one was Spanish and fourth one was from New Zealand. So uh, when I had the other ones, not the New Zealand one, I would base myself in those countries and train there and get help from the person um, and, and their environment. And it was just easier because you got you got to tournaments quicker. Um, but wait, sorry, Steve, what was your question again? Well, that was kind of answering it. Um, yeah. What tips or tricks did you use? You know, right. did, you did you meditate? Did you have 10 hours of sleep every night? Guitar, isn't it? Guitar, Guitar. the music. <laughs> yeah, all of the above. So uh, obviously uh, sleep and recovery was huge. Um, you know, ma making sure you had access to stuff. So you know, I would travel with the minimum amount of stuff I could and all I'd have like a pair of jeans and some t-shirts to go to basically and the rest was sports gear. So, you know, your rackets, I, I was super organized. I had everything in little compartments that I knew inside and out. Um, you, you become a pro at packing and what you need and um, you, you work out, you know, first you've got to get time zone adjusted, then you go into your routine. It, it becomes pretty stock standard for each tournament. It's like clockwork. Um, definitely meditation, definitely, uh, you know, making sure I'm eating well, I'm sleeping well, I'm, you know, thinking the right things if I'm not talking to someone, talking to my coach, whoever. And for me, the music stuff was super important. So, you know, I, if I had a really bad day or I had a really tough loss for me, 
doing something where I was preoccupied, so playing the guitar or doing an activity that I wasn't thinking about all the other stuff, just gave me the time to, to switch off. And um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a never ending thing to find out what worked for you and what could get you better. And it, the thing is, there is no, for me anyway, there was no secret ingredient. It was not like, yeah, now I've got it and I, it'll work every time. It was a constant, oh, great, today is this challenge. Okay, how am I going to figure this one out? So that's what I tell a lot of the the youngsters, um, you know, like when they're feeling stressed or whatever, it's, it's a constant, you just got to figure a way out of it on that day and then repeat tomorrow. There must be some perks to being on that kind of global circuit and given your music, <clears throat> your love of music, did you ever choose tournaments to coincide with like massive concerts or bands that you wanted to see? <laughs> That's a really good question. I, uh, I, I didn't choose the events, but I had, I haven't, I still have it. It's called bands in town. It's an app. And when you go to a place it tells you all the concerts that are in town based on your likes of yeah. music. So uh, I got to see some pretty cool stuff because uh, I went to, you know, big cities and I, I saw so many bands, so many music concerts. That was my thing. So if I could make it, I would make it. One time I was contemplating, I was in, I think I was in Austria and I was contemplating driving to uh, Slovakia to see Muse. Um, it wasn't too far away, but no, it just wouldn't, it didn't work out. So I, I never, I never did that, but I, if I was in the place, I'd look at it. If I could make it, I would go. I, I was thinking you're saying I contemplated it, but I won the match and I fucking missed the concert. I was pissed, <laughs> I was pissed off. <laughs> yeah. That's probably what happened actually. <laughs> um, so 36 grand slams. I imagine that probably means 36 times you were at the same tournament as a lot of these big stars. Is there a bit of socializing going on? I, I remember reading a news report when you were speaking out on Sharapova, I think, during her, her drug thing, when she, you sort of said, I haven't sp said a word to her. She doesn't talk to anyone on tour. Are the bigger name players more like that or, or how much socializing goes on? Um, it really depends. Um, you know, even though you're constantly with others and you're with this you see the same players all the time it still is an individual sport right so you don't I mean I have a hand I have a handful of players now that I would if I was in that country where they live I would give them a call and say hey let's catch up right but at the end of the day it's there's a friction to it you're you're not going to get too close to someone and be best friends because you are going to play them and it's competitive and so there's a quite a, and so some of the, well, not some of them, most of the top players have a bigger entourage. So they might have six or seven people around them and it's kind of like their bubble and um, they might be super friendly. But when you come to an event, it's kind of like you come to the courts and there's a focus to it. You're not really, you know, you can have a laugh, but at the end of the day, you're there to do a job. And a lot of those guys are, um, you know, someone like Federer at Wimbledon, he'll constantly just play cards with his teammates when he when he's ready to play and he'll have his, you know, so he'll find a table and he'll have his little entourage and they'll just be playing cards, you know. And then someone like Rafa, you know, he has his other little entourage and they're just constantly chatting about football. So it's it's you find your own little sanity bubble to keep you focused. Um, but yeah for sure there's also like player parties and you know you get you you get to know people and and when i say player parties uh, i saw shay and his light <laughs> yeah. um, they're usually at the start of an event so they welcome the players um no one's drinking because everyone has to play the next day it's more <laughs> like a have a dinner have a meal talk to people go home at eight o'clock um yeah yeah so um but you know it, you do meet a lot of cool people you um you see a lot of you know cool stuff you see a lot of um unbelievable tennis and unbelievable athletes and you see what they're doing and, and you're learning all the time um 
but yeah, there's definitely some players that choose to completely distance themselves and because that's how they deal with it and, and that's fine. And you must have made some reasonable relationships because you were a player representative on the WTA for for four years. Now, is that something that's elected by other players or are you nominated by other players or, or how does that work and what is that role? Yeah, so you're nominated by the players and then you vote, you're elected. So it's a vote by the players. Um, it's like a real democracy. Um, and anyway, so what it is is basically there are eight players in the player council who represent the players on their issues. So our job is to meet with the board of the WTA and be in, know what's going on, uh, have a player voice in there, have player perspectives. So uh, players can come to us with any issues or a chat or we're there to have the information to tell them what's going on behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so I, I really, I really love that position, and I initially really wanted to do that because I wanted to see what happens behind the scenes. So how does the tour work? Um, what goes on behind the scenes? How does you know the calendar? Because you know sometimes you have a lot of issues as a player, and you're like, well, who's who? What's the process? So that was pretty cool to to figure it out. Uh, um. What about when uh, Serena and Venus Williams came to New Zealand? Did, did you spend much one-on-one -on -one time with them at all, away, away from the court? Um, a little bit with Venus. I, I knew Venus already, and I spent time on the council with both Venus and Serena. I knew Venus better. Um, but, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't, I only saw them really when I was at the courts or they were prepping for their matches or we were doing some media stuff. But, um Otherwise, you know, a lot of them don't spend time <clears throat> on site if they don't have to, really. Um, the, um, the kind of novice assumption as well is when they come to Auckland, when they come to the Classic, you being kind of the resident face of New Zealand tennis, you'd be this sort of pseudo ambassador showing them all around because that for a while there was kind of, do you know what I mean? Like it was kind of like there was a real emphasis on bringing these stars to town. We had our, we've got our own star here. But the assumption looking out is that like, yeah, come on, guys, let's go out to Pihar and here's this and here's that. But you're actually also focusing on trying to perform and win that tournament too, right? Yeah, I, I felt I didn't really do that. I I wasn't there. At the, I think I did a couple of media stints with, you know, one at the domain by the museum and that's fine. Um, but I, I didn't feel like that. I, I think... I think the thing with the ASB Classic uh, is that it's they have to stand out because it's a really tough spot in the calendar. Uh, you know, it's the first tournament of the year, and why go to New Zealand? Why not just go directly to Australia and prep there? Because that's where all the tournaments are going to be, right? So there has to be a differentiator, and that differentiator, that's why Auckland has been voted many times as a tournament, as a player favourite, because... They make the effort, which is awesome. So they try and really take care of the players, show them around, get, you know, show them what New Zealand has to offer. Offer. Um, so there's a bit of that as well. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't personally feel like I was some kind of. <laughs> I had to be a tour guide or anything like that. I, I did what I had to do for myself, you know. So, um, but. Yeah, I mean, the, the sad thing about those tournaments, though, is that it's kind of like a little blimp. You know, it's, yeah, we've got this tennis tournament and all these stars. Yeah, everything's about tennis for two weeks of the year. But it actually doesn't actually f trickle down to tennis in New Zealand um, and actually doesn't support youngsters and other, you know, which is, which is a shame. It, that's what it should do and it should try and actually you know promote tennis in New Zealand and and get something out of it not just a one-off let's get you know some drinks and we'll watch the tennis and then forget about it and and that kind of came to a head quite publicly in 2013 with the high performance sport gymnasium kind of situation right it was this odd situation um to summarize it i think you'd had one of your best seasons you'd won your first wta 
event overseas. You'd come home to New Zealand uh, looking for support to um, for your off-season program to prepare for a, another another competition. And essentially, it kind of wasn't there. And you ended up, I think, putting your hand in your own pocket, flying a trainer out to New Zealand, and then you you weren't able to even use the facilities. You had to go and use another gymnasium. And it just seems like such a, uh, I mean, what are we now? That's, that's nine years ago. I wonder, one, whether the sport's moved on, but two, just such a slap in the face. Um, and I don't want to dig up kind of old old issues, but how frustrating was that to be, as we've alluded to, on the road for 11 months, a tough journey to come home and be like, yeah, fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. And then to have that sort of happen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it was always a struggle. Like I said, you know, there was never that support for tennis in New Zealand. And, it, you know, what, would my life have been a bit easier if there was? Probably, <laughs> you know, would have that changed anything in my performance? I don't know. Um, uh, it was frustrating. And uh, it, it, and I'm not the only sport that echoes that frustration when it comes to and I, and I get it. It's a, you know, there's a limited resource of funds for sport in New Zealand. They've selected a criteria that's based on medals and gold medal and Commonwealth medal performance. Um, but that's where I think I differ in views is that if you, if you've got really good talented people in other sports, why not support them as well? Which was when that kind of went to a peak because I don't usually go into the media to do that sort of stuff but that's when I was really frustrated you know I, I play for New Zealand I I love New Zealand I mean I was asking to use the track at you know at the facility and actually I'm I'm super glad that that article did come <clears throat> sorry come out because it did change things so I actually did finally yep they they let me use the gym they let me um, train with some of the trainers there. And I made an amazing friend and, and a guy called Brad who unfortunately passed away, but he was an amazing trainer. Um, he worked with the hockey girls. Um, so, Football as well. And I, sorry? Football as well. Brad was a, he right. was a great guy, super nice guy. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, so I made some really good connections there and, and it did, so I'm glad that that changed things. And, only now, after uh, the boys, Marcus and Mike, you know, got a bronze medal, um, we we have some, well, we have some tennis in New Zealand has a little bit more support now. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, you shouldn't really be asking that question, why don't we have any tennis players in New Zealand when you don't support it? And that, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, but... Yeah, and, and now I think they, they've created this aspirational fund uh, from what I read in the papers, which is, you know, it's, it's a step to somewhere. And also I think basketball has now gotten quite a bit more support, which is fantastic to hear as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it, is, it is a shame, you know. I, don't, don't get me wrong, limited funds, you've got to put them somewhere. You've got to place criteria around them. But I just feel like there has to be some kind of, you know, leeway there if you've got some really talented youngsters in other sports and you you want to help them as well, right? Yeah, and I, I just I think as well it's it's an interesting one that that period in in twenty thirteen because it seems at odds with and I've heard you speak about this um, your Olympic experience in two thousand and twelve and I know they're different organisations but I guess how welcome you were made to feel into that team and mixing and mingling with other Kiwi athletes. Can you talk a little bit about Beijing in 2008 and London in 2012 and, and those, one of my favourite things is teasing out Olympic Village experiences that people had and the cool things and the cool people that they met. I met Michael Phelps, but I don't like talking about it all that much. <laughs> I, For me, um, so Beijing was in 2008. Yeah, you're right. And um, to, to that point, I really didn't have a, connection with any I you know I barely knew anyone from Tennis New Zealand I didn't know who the CEO was um I didn't know any other sports people in New Zealand because I was away and when I did come home I came home and, and I spent time with my family um so when I came into the um 
village in 2008, I got such an amazing welcome. I was so blown away. Yeah. Um, I was blown away that actually people knew that I was some, I was a tennis player from New Zealand. It was just, Oh, wow. You know, and uh, that year I, I shared an accommodation with the hockey girls, which was awesome because I watched my first hockey game and I, I, I thought it was awesome. Love the sport. I still try and watch, watch a game now. Um, and I just got to meet all these other athletes from New Zealand, which was, and for me, the thing that I've always loved is being part of a team. And so whenever I played Fed Cup, which is now Billie Jean King Cup, or whenever I was at a team event or Olympics or Commonwealth Games, I just loved it because I wasn't alone anymore. I was with another team and I could talk to people and they were going through the same stuff as I was. And um, So, yeah, I was just blown away by the welcome and um and i still have some friends that i you know made <clears throat> at those olympics um so yeah it, it's something that i i definitely missed um from from tennis i've heard you speak in a number of interviews you get asked that a lot where's the next great new zealand female tennis player come from how do we help i thought i might try to frame it in a different way to get a better answer um let's paint a hypothetical say there's a 14 year old uh female maybe 15 years old she's like you were she's one of the best players in new zealand she's potentially got a future what advice would you give to her on how to approach what the future holds and what advice would you give to tennis new zealand about how best to help her get to where you got to um so i i recently just joined the board of tennis new zealand in november last year so that's uh definitely a question that um i i'm actually doing right now um <laughs> the, the first thing is is that uh the advice that i would have for her would be to not ride on success in new zealand and to go out and compete and and to buckle in because it's going to be super super hard but also an amazing and rewarding experience and um you really really need to be super resilient and have a super drive to you know to get through that um and many other things <laughs> uh for tennis new zealand it would be to just you know try and invest and to find any funds to actually um to actually get players overseas and i mean my my ideal thing would be to have a for tennis new zealand to have a base somewhere in europe or in the states where players can go where they have someone there who can look after them where they can stay where they can get to their next event um, where they have like a hub of support. Um, and the other thing that I would really want is a bit of a, is a bit of a culture change. Um, and when I say culture change, I mean, a lot of, I wouldn't say it. There, there's a perception that if you're really good in New Zealand, that you can ride on that and you can just be comfy and enjoy it. And that stuff is supposed to be given to you because you're good in New Zealand. And that's just not the case. And you, I think you really have to be humble and you have to have the guts to actually go out in New Zealand and to give it a go and then to see what you're made of. Um, and that kind of mindset is lacking a little bit, which I feel needs to change. That mindset's an interesting one. And I wanna, I wanna just pick up a point. Reference right at the top of it is that you don't play much anymore and that your shoulder's cooked and you know, you've, you've, you're probably carrying a lot of injuries from a, a life on the road. Were you ever fully fit? across that whole that whole time i don't mean that and i don't mean that in jest <laughs> like i mean that no I, I know exactly what you mean uh yeah the answer is athlete, yeah well, you, you go give the give the answer but very rarely 
when yeah. I was, it was like, um, oh my God, enjoy this moment. Uh, cause it was always something it was, it was a constant, um, the sniggle here, this injury here. I had six stress fractures, right. And that, you know, throughout my career and I, I didn't even fall or hit myself. It was just from overplaying. I, I had blood clots in my right arm that I didn't know what the hell it was. I would get like, um, numb, I would get a numb hand. I was playing a tournament. I was like, this is freaking weird. I'm like sweating like a pig and my hand is cold. And uh, I was in the States and, um, I basically went to the doctor there and they, you know, in the States, they don't really want to touch anything and they're very hands off -y. Um, so I, I flew, it got really bad. I said, I got shooting pain. So I flew, I flew home. And the next day, um, I saw, I don't know, you might know him, Shay, uh, Chris Hanna. Um, yes. he worked. Yep. So I saw Chris Hanna and he sent me straight to the hospital and I had several blood clots in my right arm, like from my shoulder to my, um, I, I've had, you know, I have a slip in my back that kept separating as I was friggin' playing for many years. That's why I retired. Um, I tore a labrum in my shoulder. Um, I have neck issues today that I have to do constant exercises for on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> it's just, it was never ending. Right. And, um, you know, the, the constant travel didn't help. So for example, I'd have to sometimes get off a plane, make it to the site and play off a plane, like off a eight hour flight, you know, and that's, that's not good for anyone. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, when, when I did have moments of kind of health, I mean, I, I, um, I had a, what is it called? Uh, I think it's an avulsion fracture uh a week or two weeks before i won the memphis title my first wta singles title i i played it with a broken thumb like i had a crack in here and the the only thing that was good was when you kind of squeeze your your racket hand for hours on end it numbs it so you you don't feel it anymore so so all like, all fun stuff you're hearing those things it makes you kind of think about and I don't want to generalize a generation but you know when young athletes now are coming through and they're like oh it's a bit too hot outside to you know to go for that extra hour and you're like fuck <laughs> seriously you have no idea what it actually takes to be a professional athlete and it's that it's that education that's that's important I think yeah I mean I think there's also I think there's a fine line between there were definitely times in my career where I overtrained and that's why I got injured too. Right. So it was that kind of harden up, get through it mentality that I took from early days um, in New Zealand, which is not beneficial sometimes because it leads to overuse and, and injury. So it's, it's that constant balance of, well, if I don't train as hard or as, as often will I get to a level, but then I can't because I'll get injured. So it's that constant fine line of, of balancing the two. I'm so glad you went into all that detail with the injuries because that's exactly kind of what we're all about. Like, that's insane. That's That all happened to your body while you were performing at the very highest level with all of the travel stuff combined and the solitary and the mental. Like, did you think people actually have an idea of how tough it is? Like, we sort of spoke about it briefly at the top, but there would be very few, right, that would have a real insight like we've spoken about today into the life of a top tennis player do you think it's underappreciated what you achieved given how tough it was i you know i i don't know i i i definitely i definitely think people who know tennis and have been around tennis and who have tried to make it like someone like a will ward would would know right um but I think general public, no, they, they wouldn't know. How could they know? Um, and do I feel underappreciated? No, because I never really, I, I, I never really read anything in the media about myself. I, you know, I, I did the best that I could with what I had and I, I'm happy with that. Um, you know, when they ask me, 
why don't we have any, you know, successful singles players? Uh, I'll give them the same answer as I did you guys if we have enough time. But, um, yeah, I, I try and explain it. But that that's okay, you know, if, if people don't get it. Um, but li like I said, for, for tennis to succeed in New Zealand and to, to become more part of the mainstream sports scene, all these other things need to happen and it's still a work in progress. So hearing hearing your overall story, it's kind of, well, for me anyway, it's understandable why you would take a hiatus from the sport once you finished and do some other things. But somewhere along the line in the last couple of years, something's been triggered. And as you've mentioned, you're on the board now of, of Tennis New Zealand. You were um, Billie Jean Cup uh, captain of the New Zealand team uh, whenever they last played. I, I, my years are getting mixed up now. But so you've you've come back into the sport. Was there anything that sort of triggered that in? Because you've obviously got massive value, I think, to add to the sport and, and not just tennis, but other sports as well. So was there a trigger that, that you thought, yeah, I'll actually get back into this and, and be involved somehow? Yeah, I, I think that I never said to myself, I want to step away from tennis forever. I wanted to step away for, for a while because, you know, I, I just needed a break. Um, I think it would be uh, a big loss if I didn't share my experiences with, you know, youngsters that, that were talented and that wanted to make it as professionals because one thing that I wish I had when I was a youngster was someone that I could actually talk to who was from New Zealand or who was a professional player, who was a female, who was older, who I could ask, hey, I'm feeling this stuff. Uh, is it normal? Um, you know, what, is, what was it like for you? I, you know, I wish I had that and I didn't. So that's something that I wish I could, um, I could give back. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, when, when I was playing, like I said, I didn't really have contact with tennis New Zealand. I felt like I, I wasn't supported. Um, but now when I'm in it, I realize that, you know, it's, it's not Tennis New Zealand's fault or anything like that. It's just, it's a very small organization that has no money, but at the end of the day, it has really good people that really want tennis to succeed and that are working hard and trying their best. And um, I think you have to look at both sides sometimes and um, that then it makes more sense to you, your journey, right? Um, so... Yeah, and I can't remember what your question was again, Shay, because I just keep talking, but there you go. <laughs> we're, we're getting towards the end. There, there are a few topical world tennis pieces that I just want to get your opinion on, and they can be sort of brief summaries, but I'd, I'd be interested to know where you stand. One of them's uh, Osaka with the mental health. One of them's uh, Ping Shui with the sexual abuse China stuff. And the other one is Djokovic with the vaccine, which is the most topical and the one we'll start with. Um, as we are recording this, I think he's still, it's still undecided whether he's going to get let into uh, Australia to play in the Aussie Open. Um, there's a bit of a fight going on there. Uh, he's been asked, he's, he's been granted an exemption. He's not, it doesn't appear he's vaccinated, but they've let him in to play anyway. Do you have thoughts about that? Is that right or wrong? I mean, what what we do know is that he's done everything by the rules, right? So we don't know if he's vaccinated or not. You can assume that since he's taken a medical medical exemption that he isn't, um, which is each to their own, right? I, I think he has gone through the process legally, as in like he went through the Australian doctor's panel great. And then he went through an anonymous outside panel and they approved it. Um, from what I understand now is, is that he's stuck in immigration because his visa doesn't allow for a medical exemption. If, <laughs> if or so, something like that, that's what I read this morning. Um, look, you know, whatever, I, I always like to stick to evidence and the facts. And um, the only thing I will say is that, um, I mean, if you are a number one tennis player in the world and you need a medical exemption for something, 
that's a miracle. You must be a freaking amazing <laughs> athlete, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like for a number one ten male tennis player to be unhealthy or in some way, right? And to, you know, to be number one and to be maybe is the greatest of all time. And I believe it's, it's quite extra extraordinary, right? So ha hats off to him. Yeah. <laughs> well played. Well, done, no well played. Um, okay. And, and the Ping Shui stuff, did you know Ping? Did, did, did you meet her on tour? And Oh, yeah, I, I played her. I played her a couple of times, I think. I think I played her once at Wimbledon. Um, yeah, so I, I knew her. Um yeah, I mean, in, in that case, um, yeah, I mean, look, I think when I was first asked about it, uh, the thing that I said was obviously number one thing is that she's healthy and safe and all good, right? Um, the stance of the WTA on that, um, you know, obviously I've been away from it a, a few years now. They probably had enough evidence to make a decision. So, um, and in one way, hats off for standing up for, you know, for uh, one of our players, because that's something that WTA is very strong about is protecting our players and making sure we're all good, um, which was what, you know, the council and, and its whole structure was all about. Um, you know, when I played in China, um, the, the events were incredible. Look, uh, it was like, it was amazing. You would have like a kind of like a grand slam venue at an event, right, in China. And they did a, such an amazing job. Um, and the only thing I can re really remember is that I couldn't use my Facebook or my whatever. I couldn't keep in touch with people because it was, you know, I couldn't use it. Um, but, you know, uh like i say uh, i think people don't realize how lucky we are to live in new zealand there's a lot of weird and scary stuff that happens and i get asked quite a bit you know if i didn't live in new zealand where would i live and i kind of start naming some things but then i go through like a pros and cons list in my head and i always end up back in new zealand um so yeah i think um like I like I've said, I, I hope that you know she she's okay and that it all works out for her in the end. And I'm glad that the WTA is um, making sure that that's a priority. And last one, the Naomi Osaka stuff with the press conferences and and the mental health. Um, could you understand where she was coming from? Do you think that the press conferences should be part of the the tennis experience for a player? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's also, like I say, two sides to everything. So, you know, sh we all sign a agreement at the beginning, you know, that the media thing is part of our, so she has signed a thing where she, is, it is her responsibility to be part of media stuff, right? So then the question is, uh, does, does the, do those press conferences and do media affect athletes mental health yes for sure sometimes absolutely D is it good for for some players as in like does it get their name out there is it good for sponsors is it good for funding absolutely it's all it's all part of it as well right so i think the question then becomes should there be a tweak or an adjustment to that initial contract based on the well-being of a player and i think absolutely right so if if a player is not feeling well or it's you know they're in a bad place yeah absolutely you know maybe they have to talk to someone or be evaluated or i i don't know talk to a physio or a doctor and then just say the doctor might just say look she's exempted from media this week great you know um but you're looking at me uh was... Shay, like a Confused. Sorry. No, no, no. You're right. I'm sorry to stop you, but Stephen's trying to signal me to do something and I couldn't work out what he was <laughs> oh, trying to do. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, all good. All good. I, I thought, yeah. Anyway, so just like a, a rule there that is, is has a little bit of leeway, as in, like, you know, it's not as just black and white, as in, like, yes, you have to do a, a press conference all the time whenever, it, you know, sometimes you, you're not feeling up to it and it does affect your health. So, Again, that should be a priority. Sort of like a distracted podcast host.
throws you off your answer. <laughs> Apologies. Not at all. Not at all. No, no, I just thought I was saying something that was completely <laughs> no, off field. We, I was like, oh man. <laughs> we've got we've got hand signals going on left, right, and center. And I was like, I was like, I'm just like, queuing them up for the next question. Yeah, which I'm going to take in a slightly different direction <laughs> as part of a double act. And uh, in my very very amateur tennis career, I was more of a double specialist than I was singles. Mm. Could you have prolonged your career by by focusing on doubles? And second part, how do you choose a doubles partner on the tour? I um I always focused on singles. So that was my drive and that was my priority. And I don't think that I enjoyed it that much to have stuck around to have played doubles only. In in a in a short answer, so. For me, it wasn't as worth it as it was when I was motivated and driven by singles. Um, How do you find a doubles partner? Um, It really depends, right? So you have singles players that play doubles. You have singles players that only play singles and you have doubles players that only play doubles. Um, So it really depends in which category you are. So if you are a doubles player only, the ideal scenario would be to find another doubles only player that you can train and you can have a consistent partnership. When it was someone like me who played singles and doubles, priority would always be on the singles for me. So I'd find someone, I, I'd hate to, you know, stick to only a doubles player because my, you know, I would be yeah. sort of, I would be kind of on and off, right? And that's not fair to them. So in essence, you kind of, as a singles player playing doubles, you'd kind of sometimes rock up to the tournament and just see whoever's looking to play doubles that week. Um, And for me, choosing a partner was always not based on ranking or how they play. Or It was more like, hey, do I get on with that person? Will we have a good time on the court? Will we have stuff to talk about? That that will, you know, will we have fun? And that was my... That's and and again, that's why you you see I had a lot of different partners um, because the singles always kind of took priority, and I couldn't maintain a constant relationship with just a doubles only. We we would try sometimes, but you got injured, your schedule changed. It was really hard to maintain. Last question from me. Um, you're working now. And I understand the transition from uh, sport, being a professional athlete for so long can be difficult. Does life feel normal now when you go to work each day and come home? And and where does, what does the next five, 10 years look like? Um, life felt normal. I was really craving the normalcy. I, I wanted like to get mail in the letterbox that I could take out and look at physically, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Uh, I wanted to like tell a friend, hey, they asked me, hey, in six weeks, it's my whatever, 30th, oh, I can make it, I'll be here. You know, it's like these little things just, it's it's amazing. I, uh, I could go into my closet and I could, oh my God, I can use any of my clothes, like <laughs> any of them. <laughs> they're all right here uh, you know like i can wear any of my shoes because i don't have a 23 kg limit on my bag <laughs> you know it's it was just those little things uh, in the beginning and um now yeah i think um i think i'm still adjusting like for example you might be wondering why the hell is she wearing sunglasses in an interview and it's because um they're actually prescriptions so they have a little bit of um of a correction but they're also i struggled with the glare of the computer screens you know because now i'm constantly on a screen and it was just really hard on my eyes and so this really helps me um and just like uh, this uh, yeah i know it's pretty funny yeah, uh, that makes sense yeah. because i was thinking it's the muso thing that i was thinking <laughs> it's, it's, quite a, it's actually quite a cool I, yeah, look i was just I, as soon as you said it i just thought yeah we've actually let this go like nearly two hours <laughs> without even talking about <laughs> the elephant in the room oh that's so good <laughs> yeah so usually when i'm at work people are like what the 
you know, what on earth? Like, who does she think <laughs> she is? Over like, there, just yeah, sitting whatever. There, sitting at her workspace. <laughs> yeah. I I kind of enjoy it because I'll be I've had so many client meetings over lockdown and I just wait, will they ask, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> no one ever does. No, we didn't. No one we ever didn't. does. <laughs> Uh, so it's just those little things of looking at screens and adjusting and uh, I definitely don't have as much downtime as I did when I was a tennis player. You know, it's it's kind of like uh, the job and then life admin and <clears throat> yeah, it's um, <laughs> I remember when I started and I was like, you know, society is really structured stupidly. Like you literally like you're just working five days a week you get to your weekend you have no time you're like you basically have no time to do your main like laundry or normal things and then it's like sunday and you've got to go to work again and then you have to like apply to get like leave to be with your family it's like it's just it's yeah. so idiotic don't you think <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah we're stuck in the matrix <laughs> that's, that's yeah. what it is um but um yeah it's uh, i mean in, in some parts it's nice that things don't hurt and um yeah i like i said it's it's uh, like i i don't get stressed at work it's you know if it's like a it's just will will the company still be running if i stuff something up yes it will it's all yes. good <laughs> Um, Shay, last bits and pieces. Um, no, I, list is ticked. All the boxes are ticked. I, my only, I guess, request would be for you to get back on that Instagram and provide me with more uh, giggle worthy <laughs> content. It's a shame that you've trapped that sense of humor away, or we have to become friends, one of the two. So we'll see <laughs> which way that falls. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do, Shay. Well, maybe it'll be the, the friends one. All right. Yeah, but let's, let's force her back on social media, which is bad for her mental health. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's a good idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, what have I done? Hey, um, thank you so much, Marina. That has been epic. That's been so insightful and interesting and good. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, what's and all, uh, I know people are going to love it. Shay normally has a, a nice little outro. Yeah, I think three months worth waiting for. And really, one of my favorite things when we do these podcasts is actually uncovering the person behind the research. And that's, for me, been the most exciting part of this kind of this episode is I had absolutely no idea going into it what you were like as a person and nobody probably does. So for those people that have um, taken the time to listen, I'm sure they will um, have a very different opinion of Marina Rakovic and who she is and what she's about. So I urge people to get onto that Instagram for some good content coming forward. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks. I really enjoyed um, talking to you and, and thanks for all the really interesting questions and uh, appreciate the research that's gone into it. So, um, yeah, lovely to talk to you both. Cool. Cheers, Marina.